seems that I was muted. Oh, love this age of technology. <laughs> so let me welcome you all again. We're here for the community read, Meet the Author with Anna Jean Mayhew. And if you didn't already know what community read was, let me tell you. Community Read is the library's month-long effort to have the community read or listen to books of current and relevant topics and participate in discussions, book clubs, and events hosted by the library and community partners. And this year, the signature title is Tomorrow's Bread by tonight's guest, Anna Jean Mayhew. But we also have companion titles for all of our different aged readers. We have Windows in the Blue House for the Children. We have Take Back the Block and the Epic Fail of Arturo Zamora um, for our middle grade students. And we have Pride for our teen readers. We actually will have the author of Pride who will be visiting us virtually on March 30th. So definitely. Um, look out for that. That will be streamed live. But we have a whole host of other programs that are going to be available for the rest of the month of March. Um, that includes programs provided by our community partners, like Dream Key Partners, who will be offering a home buyer's education overview in Spanish um, on March 30th. Um, SCORE is going to have simple steps for starting your business um, tomorrow. And there will be a whole host of book clubs and different events for the rest of the month that you can find at cmlibrary.org slash community read. And while you're attending all of those programs, we'd love for you to participate in our community read challenge. You can find a link to that on the community read page, or you can try and type in the bit.ly link really quickly. All right. Well, we definitely want to see you at the, the programs coming up. And if you've already attended programs, feel free to join the challenge and tell us what you've been doing and how you've been participating and engaging in the community read. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on AJ Mayhew who is the author of Tomorrow's Bread. Now she's the author of two books and her second book, Tomorrow's Bread is the Community Read signature title. If you wanna learn more about AJ, you can always visit her website at AnnaGeneMakeU.com. But since we have her here in person, virtually, we'd love to hear directly from the author more about her and Tomorrow's Bread. AJ, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Yolanda. And thank you for everything you've done to make this possible. Before I begin, I would like to give the viewers a visual of Brooklyn through a video of a song composed by Melissa Summersell and co-created by Jackson Fall. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Neighbors wave on streets of a town within a town. Sipping tea on peaceful porches some of them are broken down when we got free we settled here our school and church bells rang for years and years this was our home until the dozers came down by Little Sugar 
long second in pearl Nestled in North Carolina This town was our whole world Generations building families Proud of what they became Black was black and white was white But love was all the same The town of Brooklyn lived and breathed The people were its heart Imperfect, yes, but it was ours even with its rougher parts Letters came in 61 Said it would be torn down And so began the needless death Of our town within a town Different and misunderstood Picked apart till it was good and gone They made uptown out of our town Promised we'd be better off That promise broke but worst of all our community was gone They raised our dead, tore down our homes And now tall buildings stand Where we once lived and loved and laughed Gone for progress of the man Gone for progress of the man Thank you, Yolanda, for rolling that song for us. I'll begin with a reading from the book, and then I will talk about why I chose that reading, the significance of it. This is a passage from the opening of the book, and it's somewhat um, collapsed. I didn't read the whole of the passage. Down in the gully, Little sugar whispers sliding through the night like a ghost. On a pretty day, it calls my boy to it. If I don't catch Hawk first, he'll be halfway to Pearl Street, a bucket in one hand, a net made from a stocking in the other. Bent on frogs or crawdads or whatever pulls him down to where that creek lives. He doesn't know how slippery the mud bank gets in early March, how quick the water could drag him under. Day coming on, got to rouse Hawk soon, get him fed and dressed. Bibi, my grand, say when he was born, enjoy him being a baby, Rayleigh, it won't last. He's six now, long legs, knobby knees, in first grade. I walked to Myers Street School with him for a week last September to be sure he knows how to get there, to look up and down the street before crossing, use the tunnel under the boulevard. We leave the house and he tugs on me to stop so he can holler, hey, to Doobie Franklin next door 
or to Johnny No Age in his delivery van. At the school, we go to a room that's different day to day because Miss Madison keeps changing the maps and pictures on the walls, arranges the desks in rows one day, a circle the next. She keeps calling me Mrs. Hawkins, thinking a mother must be married. Now Hawk gets to school on his own. I stand out front and watch him going away from me, slim like his daddy, his round head bobbing while he talks to himself the way he does, then around the corner and out of sight. That opening gives you the character I most wanted the reader to feel was telling the story. Lorelei Lee Hawkins. She is, um, at this point in the story, well, she's the first person narrator, and I chose present tense to give it more of a forward motion. And throughout the book, as her chapters come up, it is first person, present tense. The other characters are in third person, past tense. You meet Bibi, her grandmother, in this briefly. And you meet Hawk, her son. And what the one you don't meet in this family is Uncle Ray. And you will come upon him later. The second major narrative character is Eben. Ebenezer Gabriel Polk, who is a minister at the uh, St. Timothy's Presbyterian Church on McDowell Street. And the third one is Percy Persephone who lives in Myers Park, just a little ways down the road, two miles away. And um, she is also third person, past tense. I want to give you just a little bit of the overall of the story. In 1961, rumors of urban renewal fly through the black neighborhood of Brooklyn in downtown Charlotte, North Carolina. When the bulldozers roll, a grandmother is forced from the home she's lived in all her life. A minister stands by helpless as his wife's coffin is exhumed in a cemetery condemned by the city. In this Jim Crow setting, the mother of a biracial boy must hide her love for his white father. Two miles away, in upscale white Myers Park, a woman is drawn into the conflict, despite her husband's conviction that the redevelopment is vital for Charlotte. Civic promises are broken, neighbors are torn apart, and century-old Brooklyn is demolished as city planners buy for the valuable acreage. And about the title, um, I found this poem by Langston Hughes, and it just would, it wouldn't leave me alone. I felt that this was absolutely the, um, that I had to have it in the book. So I got permission to put it in the front of the book. It's called Democracy. Democracy will not come today, this year, nor ever through compromise and fear. I have as much right as the other fella has to stand on my two feet and own the land. I tire so of hearing people say, let things take their course. Tomorrow is another day. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Freedom is a strong seed planted in a great need. I live here too. I want freedom, just as you. So that is the derivation of the title. As you know, uh, the title is Tomorrow's Bread. I was um, challenged by the publisher and asked if I could change it, but I didn't. And I had a strong reason for that. So often when people are being, being oppressed, and looking for change. They are told 
just wait, it'll come, just wait. And that's the, uh, of course, the impact of that poem, and that's why I chose that title. Let me go on to, here we go. As I am writing, I will often look up other writers. I will look at what other writers have had to say about writing. And I came across, if I can find it, if I can't, I'll just move right on. Yeah, this quote, and it was really helpful to me. A note, despair at the badness of the book. Can't think how I ever could write such stuff. And with such excitement. That's yesterday. Today, I think it good again. A note by way of advising other Virginias with other books. That this is the way of things. Up, down. Up, down. And Lord knows the truth. That's from A Writer's Diary by Virginia Woolf. There are recurring themes in this novel, and I'm going to read some other passages from the book that will underline these themes a little bit, but I'll tell you what they are, and then later I will go into um, detail about the themes. Loss is the first one. Oppression by social norms is the second one. And change is the third one. And I'll elaborate on those in a minute. Okay. I'll give you a little bit of Reverend Ebenezer Gabriel Polk. The Reverend Ebenezer, Ebenezer Gabriel Polk sat by his dining room window, staring at motes of dust in a sunbeam that fell across his Bible. He preferred the revised standard version for his personal worship, felt it was the clearest word of God, though he had not convinced his flock of that. The church's worn King James stayed at the pulpit so he could read from it during sermons, as the congregation expected. The opening pages of the Old Bible recorded the history of the church. St. Timothy's Second Presbyterian was Second Presbyterian colored when it was founded in 1842. After the Civil War, the elders elected to drop colored, and to add St. Timothy. Why, he often wondered, with that pale saint's Catholic connections. As he had done most of his life, he closed his eyes, <clears throat> wandered through the Bible, flipping pages. In his previous reading, he had opened to Isaiah, where he was reminded to exalt the Lord and praise his name throughout all the earth. Such commands bothered him. Why would a deity need blatant worship that approached flattery? He varied his readings as much as possible, hoping for spiritual guidance. With his finger sliding down the inside column of the left page toward the end of the Bible, he opened his eyes enough to be sure he wasn't in Revelation, which he didn't like or trust or understand. At 1 Peter 4, 7, he focused and began to read. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, keep sane and sober for your prayers. The end of all things, those graves, the sacred resting places, that would now be uprooted, with him unable to stop 
the looming desecration. And I'll stop there for a minute and um, explain there never was a graveyard in Brooklyn, in Second Ward, in Charlotte, North Carolina. I took some uh, license, fictional literary license, and put the graveyard in Brooklyn because graveyards were upheaved, they were uh, exhumed, bodies were exhumed and moved, and most of them were African American. And there are many slave graveyards that the same thing has happened because the land that they're planted in is too valuable. So I decided to just put that in the book. Then um, we find that Evan, as a preacher, is beginning to have doubts really strong doubts in his faith. And we get the genesis of that from a little bit further reading. He speaks to, an, uh, to a photograph of his wife and says uh, that arthritis is bothering him. And he says he loved that image of Nettie. They'd gone to the state fair where a roving photographer caught her laughing at something he couldn't remember. Her mouth slightly open, sunlight on her curls. Her death three years earlier still bewildered him. One day she didn't feel well, and the next she was moaning in pain, and then she passed. That's how the progression of her illness felt to him. Dead at diagnosis, he had overheard someone say at the hospital and felt again that mix of grief and powerlessness. Palliative care, her doctor had told him, adding, as if there was no way he could have understood, she won't suffer. How could they know, those doctors with their needles and pills, whether his Nettie suffered? He had sat by her bed for a month, held her, talked to her as if she could hear him, while she slipped away into what? His concept of heaven shifted during her final days, and he could never again say with certainty that there was anything after this life. So that gives you a good glimpse into Reverend Polk, whose family, by the way, goes back to President Polk. You learn that later in the book. I chose that name deliberately. And the doubts that he has follow him all the way through the book. Then we're going to go to the um, third narrator, Percy. And I'll give you a little bit about her. On that steamy afternoon in July 1955, when Percy Marshall first went into Brooklyn, she left her home on Sterling Road, feeling in charge of her life. No one knew where she was headed. On East Hill Street, she was startled by what she saw, a block of unpainted shacks hugging the curb, no more than six feet of alley between them. Wooden chairs on tiny stoops, garbage cans curbside. A cloud of dust rose in her rearview mirror. She turned onto Meyer Street and passed several pastel bungalows with picket fences. In the front yard of 704 South Myers was a sign, Mrs. Roberta Stokes, seamstress. She sat and looked at the blue house with its white shutters and tidy lawn, azaleas to each side of a stone walk, leading to a porch with a rocker, potted begonias, hanging ferns. What would it be like to live by myself in a cozy house like this? She got out awkwardly, sliding her swollen belly from under the steering wheel and locking the car. Her heels thumped hollowly on the front porch. A note above a brass button said, please ring bell. 
She stood for a moment by the rocker before pressing the bell. The woman who came to the door was at least six feet tall and fair-skinned with the doe-colored hair of blonde going silver. If Percy had seen her from the back on a city street, she would have taken her for white. Mulatto. The woman looked at her directly. Yes. I called you several days ago, Mrs. Blair Marshall. Yes, ma'am. You're wanting a christening gown. I'm Roberta Stokes. Come on in. The woman opened the screen and gestured to a chintz sofa. Angled beside the couch was a green corduroy easy chair, starched curtains in the windows, beaded flowers in a vase beneath a wall of photos. This could be a neighbor's house in Myers Park. Have a seat. I'll go get my pictures. Oh, you want a Coke or a glass of water? I could make iced tea, but that'd take a while. Water, please. Percy sat on the sofa. She smelled something familiar, pleasant. Gardenias in a bowl on an end table by her elbow. Not a hint of brown. They must have been picked that morning. The woman returned with a glass of water and a photo album sat down next to her. This book shows what I can do. Percy turned several pages. Mrs. Stokes, your work is elegant. You call me Roberta. Thank you, and I'm Percy. No, ma'am, you're Mrs. Marshall. That's the way it is. All right, Mrs. Stokes. That's the way it should be. And so that passage uh, introduces you to the white character in the book, the leading white character in the book. And later in this same chapter, she tells her husband where she has been. He is a member of the uh, uh, board of uh, the board of people who are going to do the urban renewal, the, re the um, commission, excuse me, the redevelopment commission. And she tells him where she's been, that she's been to Brooklyn. And he just uh, doesn't pitch a fit, but he very sternly says, you don't go down there again. It's dangerous. And she tries to tell him about the nice houses she had seen on Myers Street. I'll go back now and talk a little bit about the themes. Theme one loss. Anybody who picks up this book and reads it knows that Brooklyn is gone. You know that from the blurbs and from uh, information on the jacket of the book that a neighborhood is wiped out in urban renewal. What you don't know, of course, is what happens to the people who live in that neighborhood. So it's a continual theme all the way through the book of loss. Loss of home, Loss of spouse, loss of parents, and loss of naivete, innocence. So that, to me, was the first major theme. The second one was a little bit more difficult for me to flesh out for, for this talk tonight. Oppression by social norms. Lorelei and Mr. Griffin, who is the father of her son. And in 1962, which was even before the lawsuit Loving versus Virginia that came in 1967 and did away with laws against biracial marriage. So Lorelei and Mr. Griffin, Griffin there's a, a strong social norm against biracial relationships, but she can't help falling in love with him any more than he can help falling in love with her. So you'll have to read the book to find out what happens to them, but that certainly, they were certainly oppressed by social norms. The right of those in power to take from those not in power, which has for centuries been a social norm. 
And certainly that was true of the Brooklyn neighborhood. Those in power, like the Redevelopment Commission, saw that the land, which was three blocks from the square, the intersection of Trade and Tryon, that land was just too valuable. So it was couched in terms of blight, claiming that it was 70% blight. In my research, I could never back up that claim. There was blight. It might have been 30%, 40%, I don't really know. But it, I'm convinced it wasn't 70%. But that was used so that those in power could take away from those not in power. Another social norm, this one just kind of came to me as I was making this list, the necessity of marriage for childbirth. Like uh, Hawk's teacher calls Lorelei Mrs. Hawkins, assuming a mother must be married. And back in the early 60s, that was certainly, certainly true. Then we've got the third theme, and there are other themes in the book, but these were three major themes. Change. The impact of change on places and people, and how change affects those people, and how it affects the places. Those people must adapt. They don't really have any choice. And move they really did not have a choice. So change was absolutely huge. I was asked if I had a feeling for the impact of my novel, how it would, um, what impact would it have? What impact would tomorrow's bread have? And my grandiose wish was that my book would stop urban renewal when I knew good and well that it would not. My realistic wish or hope was that city redevelopment officials would think in terms of restore rather than destroy. And if that was any, if that came out of tomorrow's bread, then I'm happy. Now I'm going to go and read you a couple more things. Okay, here we go. All right, this is a short scene of the family, and it includes a little bit about Uncle Ray but it'll give you just a little bit of a sense of how urban renewal, the people that urban renewal affected. And again, we're back in Lorelei's voice. We having supper when Johnny No Age comes in the back door carrying a bouquet for BB, like he does from time to time. Flowers he can't sell, but are still pretty. And an aside is that by this time in the book, you know that Johnny is um, has a flower shop. Hey, Johnny, say Bibi, you want a glass of tea? No, ma'am, can't stay. He puts the flowers in the sink and runs water over them. Stick them in a mason jar after supper. And that quick, he's gone. A nice boy, say Uncle Ray. Uh-huh. Shame, though. A shame, Biggie. Bibby shakes her head. Johnny, he tells folks his name is Johnny, no H, but they hear it wrong, is six and a half feet tall, thin as a rail, and pitch black. If Bibby sees him walking down the street, she say, there go that licorice whip. She's fond of Johnny, even if she doesn't approve of what he is. Several men used to go in and out the back door to his shop. Now, only the one, 
a bookkeeper from Raleigh who moved in with him two, three years ago. Sedman's Flowers is a bright spot in a gray block of rundown stores, so no one makes a, sh a move to push Johnny No Age out of Brooklyn. But he's got two strikes against him, being Africa black and a queer. We sit at the table when Mary's hemp hill calls from the front door. Loraley, Bibby looks up, her eyes round. We Grand Central Station this evening. I push my chair back. It's Mary's baby for me. Go on. She stabs up a fork full of green beans, cocks her ear to the radio we listen to while we eat. WGIV weekend jive. She starts singing, waving her fork, beans dropping. Mama said there'd be days like this. Hawk tosses a bean back on her plate, laughing. May Reese is standing inside the front door in a cloud of perfume. She's in her glad clothes, glad it's Saturday night, glad to have a friend girl. You want to go hopping? Got her hair piled up in a wave, glossy with lustrous silk, a pearl flower in it, a purple flower in it, her red satin blouse tucked into her swirly purple skirt. She plops into Uncle Ray's chair crossing her legs, swinging one foot. There's scuff marks on her red ankle straps. Uncle Ray comes into the living room, stops when he sees May Reese in his chair. You got on some powerful cologne, May Reese. She pays no mind to his frown. Thank you, Ray. He shakes his head, goes out to the porch with his pipe. Mama! Hawk calls from the kitchen. Can I eat your pork chop? No, I holler. I ask me, Reese. You want to wait for me? I'll go on over to Takis. May Reese gets up, waves her polished nails as she opens the screen. See you there in a bit. And I'm going to skip over a little bit because um, this next passage is really important in something that happens later in the book, and I think you'll understand when I read it. Takis, I've skipped some. I'm jumping over. Takis is a block up First Street, and I take my time, speaking to folks I pass, my heels making a pleasant sound on the sidewalk. The air smells faintly of sewer, drifting up from little sugar. I don't know how folks in blue heaven can stand living right on a branch of the creek where the stink can get bad, especially in the heat of summer. Passing the alley between the drugstore and the barbershop, I hear the clack of dice, the clink of coins, craps, milk money going down. A boy runs past me, skids into the alley, shouting, Why y'all starting without me? A light goes on across the street. Hey, Lorelei. Hey, Johnny. You've been open on Saturday evening? No, making a wreath for a funeral tomorrow. Johnny looks up and down First Street, then crosses over. Who died? Dicker Phillips. You remember him in Morella? Sure do. The Parkinson's got him, huh? From what Morella told me, maybe a stroke. He passed out Thursday evening, dead by the time they got to Samaritan. Johnny is so tall and skinny, it's like talking to a lamppost. Things will be easier on her now, he say, after him being sick such a long time. And I'll skip on down. A couple heads toward town on the other side of the street, arm in arm, laughing. Johnny touches his chin, nervous jerky. A car drives by, moving slow, tooting the horn to people it passes. He jumps back. I gotta go. He walks away fast, his shoes clapping the pavement. And I, as I wrote that, was hoping that it would portend what's going to happen with Johnny No Age. 
now. I'll give you another quote of the ones that I keep about writing. And they help me so much if I get stuck or I want to find out what other writers say about writing. One of my favorite writers is Flannery O'Connor. And she wrote, Writing a novel is a terrible experience during which the hair often falls out and the teeth decay. I'm always irritated by people who imply that writing fiction is an escape from reality. It is a plunge into reality, and it's very shocking to the system. I thought about what did she mean by it's a plunge into reality. When I was writing Tomorrow's Bread, it is a story based on reality. Fictionalized, yes, but writing this book was indeed a plunge into reality. Flannery also said something I've kept in mind for many years, believing as I do that she was speaking to writers. I can't prove that, but I think she was. She said, you shall know truth and the truth shall make you odd. And I like to think I am odd as a writer. I can't imagine being a writer if I hadn't been a reader first. And I'm such a slow reader that at times I have devalued my reading. So this next quote has been a great assurance for me, a reminder that writers must be readers, slow readers. I read closely, word by word, sentence by sentence, pondering each deceptively minor decision the writer has made. And though it's impossible to recall every source of inspiration and instruction, I can remember the novels and stories that seemed to me revelations, wells of beauty and pleasure that were also textbooks, private lessons in the art of fiction. And that was some from Francine Prose. She calls this learning to read like a writer. I'll end with a quote that I've used before when I'm talking about why I became a writer, why my three children are all in creative endeavors of one sort or another, writer, musician, photographer. If you want to hurt your parents, go into the arts. I'm not kidding. The arts are not a way to make a living. They are a very human way of making life more bearable. Practicing an art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, for heaven's sake. Sing in the shower. Dance to the radio. Tell stories, write a poem to a friend, even a lousy poem. Do it as well as you possibly can. You will get an enormous reward. You will have created something. And that's about all I've got to tell you tonight. I would encourage all of you out there who want to be writers to read. And to write. My first novel wasn't published till I was 71. My second one was 79. So I often tell people whose hair is white like mine, it's never too late. I really encourage you. Thank you. Well, AJ, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I know you've talked a lot about your characters um, in this program, but Tara had a question for you asking who is your favorite character in Tomorrow's Bread? Mine is Uncle Ray. Now, oh. who answered that hers was Lorelei, um, Lorelei but yeah. what's yours? Well, it would be a cross between Uncle Ray, Lorelei, Eben, BB, Hawk. I mean, as I was writing, I loved all of them. Uncle Ray certainly did tug at my heart. 
he has uh, one quote that he, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but he tells Hawk when Hawk wants to know if uh, Adam and Eve was one of them white and one of them black. And Uncle Ray gives that some thought. And he says, well, I guess so. Else, how did we get here? And I love that. He's a kind, wise man. All right. And we had a question from Eleanor. And Eleanor asks, um, I guess she has a book club. Uh huh. And one of the questions that came up in her book club was, Mr. Griffin and Loreley's relationship healthy? He was her boss, older, couldn't be public with their relationship. She was younger and idealized him. Oh, that's an interesting question. He wasn't that much older than she, just a couple of years. And he came from a family where his father was horribly, horribly prejudiced. So he knew that his parents could never know that they had a biracial grandchild. Yes, she was um, younger. And she did idealize him, but I think he idealized her, too. So I never thought of it as being unhealthy. I thought of it as being hidden. It was something they had to hide. And maybe in that respect, uh, not too healthy. I mean, it could have been dangerous if they'd been caught. And the next question comes from Diana. Um, do you feel your book can be an instrument today to make us see that things haven't changed very much since this period over 80 years ago? Well, let me think. 1962 to 2022, is that 80 years? I guess it is. And um, I have to disagree with the question. I think things have changed. We still are in some ways in Jim Crow. A lot of it is alive today, and that makes me very sad. But I'll give you a little example. My first novel, I asked a teenager, an African-American teenager, to read it and to give me a critique, and she did. She was 16. She gave me a good critique, but she also said that the character of Mary, who was a 47-year-old black woman, was like a female Uncle Tom. And that really bothered me. It surprised me and it bothered me. And then I realized this was in 1980, I mean, 19, excuse me, 2006. I realized that that girl had been born in 1990 and she had no experience of black women having to look at the ground when they spoke to a white person or having to get off the sidewalk if a white person was coming down the sidewalk, a lot of things like that. I, I won't go into a long list. So I think things have changed, but there's so much more need and room for change. Um, and I think you've spoken about this in some of your um, earlier programs. Uh, you mentioned, but Miss, I'm sorry, Miss. Press Psych 88 says, um, you mentioned in your author's note that you kept one feature of incorrect English in Loreley's speech. Can you talk about what that was and yeah. why you chose to keep it that way? Yeah. I got a reader in Alabama, Leon Gills, who read my first chapter when it was in draft and he and he had lived in Brooklyn. He he grew up in Brooklyn. And he told me that the story was good, but I'd gotten Loreley's voice all wrong. And he was correct. And he said anybody who graduated from Marist Street School or Second Ward High would come out speaking correct English. I also wanted to familiarize her, to make her sort of accessible, I guess I would say. And several of the Black characters do have absolutely perfect English, like Evan is a good example. She would, um, her laps would be BB say instead of BB says, it's in the present tense. And if you're reading the book on paper, you would see that she said, I used to go, U-S-E, to go, instead of I used to go. But we all do that. So those were a couple of minor lapses in her speech. All right. And Kaylee um, asks, when choosing your three narrators, what helped you come up with their backgrounds and purposes in the book? Oh, that's a good one. Well, Loreley sort of chose me. I mean, she came to me 
and just would not leave me. And I thought, okay, she lived in Brooklyn. This is my first character. I'm going to talk about her. Then I realized that important uh, people in Brooklyn were, many of them were teachers, doctors, lawyers, preachers, the ministers. They were really, really important. So I thought, okay, I need a, I need a minister. And then Evan approached me and started talking to me. That's how it happens for me. The characters come to me and I almost feel like they're dictating, you know. So I changed uh, Brooklyn Presbyterian to St. Timothy's Presbyterian, but it's located exactly where Bro Brooklyn Presbyterian was. Oh, the third narrator, Percy. I wanted a white voice. I thought it would be unreal if we had totally, from the black point of view, since I am white, and I needed to uh, get a white character in there to say a little bit about how, the re what was the reaction to what was happening in Brooklyn. She was the hardest one for me to write because she was the one closest to me. All right. And we did get a comment from Chexy04 who said she loved the comments, I'm sorry, the quotes that you shared during <laughs> your talk. Um, and maybe Chexy uh, will try and get those and share them somehow. I might be able to go back okay. into the comments for this live conversation and add those quotes at a separate time. Yeah. Uh, we did have a question from um, Daphne. You mentioned civic promises that were broken and she was hoping that oh, you could yeah yeah as there's a line in the song that you heard tonight that uh, they were promised they'd be better off and i guess some people were the ones certainly who lived in blight might have been moved or helped to move to a better location but the civic promises were we would help you relocate for one thing and that just didn't happen or if it happened it didn't happen very much some people were given the renters were given 30 days to move a uh, someone who owned a home like bb did she owned her house might be given a couple months three or four months but you had to find another place to live you were not helped with that so those were some of the civic promises that were broken all right um and I want to say thank you to Susan, who did our math for us. Um, so it was 60 years ago when uh, <laughs> during the time period that we were writing about and that you wrote about in Tomorrow's Bread and not 80. So thank you for doing thank that you. math. I, I thought it was 60. And then I thought maybe maybe my brain is mixed up. But I thought it was 60 years, not 80. It was 70, um, almost 70 years from my first book. And certainly things, it was set in 1954, right after Brown v. Board. So certainly uh, we have come a ways since then, but still need to go further. And we'll do one last question. This is from Tom, but um, Suzanne also has a similar question. Okay. Um, Tom says, hey, AJ, love the book. Um, did you find it difficult to write in a first person narrative of a black woman during a time of such oppression when you are white yourself? And Suzanne's um, point, um, she just had an additional question on top of that was how did you do research in this area? Okay, I love both those questions. Yes, it was initially really hard to write in Loretta Lee's voice. And as I said, I had to get help with her voice and to realize that in my head it was wrong. I just had it wrong. So I corrected that. And then I relied on the fact that we're both women and I had children very young. She was 18, I think, when Hawk was born and I was 20 when my first one was born. So we did have that similar experience. She was a high school graduate. I was a high school graduate. I do not have college, but I did grow up in a position of privilege and I had to really realize that when I was creating Laura Lee and uh, trying to capture her. Uh, research. Oh, goodness, not sure where to start. As I said earlier today, I went to the Carolina room of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library and got help from Sheila Baumgardner, who brought me out a two foot stack of stuff on Brooklyn papers. I also went to um, 
UNC Charlotte, where they had recordings of the voices. Those are still available if people want to go to the archives at the UNC Charlotte, where you can listen to people who lived in Brooklyn. That was hugely helpful. And a lot of other places, Johnson C. Smith, um, the um, online, although I learned very quickly not to trust what I learned online. And then, um, okay, someone just handed me something. The positive effects of tomorrow's bread. Oh, golly. I am glad to see the new signs about Brooklyn. I can't chalk that up to tomorrow's bread, but I am tickled, tickled to see them. I would love to hope that tomorrow's bread had a little bit of effect in that, but I'm loving what's happening. The resurgence of interest in Brooklyn. Did you have another? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize you had finished. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. Um, I got a question from Lydia. Um, uh -huh. She says, you included a map of Brooklyn, which was helpful. Did you consider including some pictures of the area? I wish I could have. Uh, there is a book called Water for Elephants, and it has pictures at the beginning of every chapter, and I would love to have done that. This just didn't seem to be the book for that. The map was vital. And my publisher sort of pushed on that, said I couldn't put a map of Charlotte on a five by seven page, but I did. And the map of Brooklyn to me was vital, including the list of places that were there in 1962. When anybody says it was full of blight and there were no businesses and lawyers and doctors and churches and schools and theaters and library, and there were. So I wanted to put those things in and they, the map really helped with that. All right. And somebody did um, ask if the, those pictures were available um, to use as a walking tour when you had shown the video earlier at the top of this program. And I did want to let everyone know that the Levine Museum of the New South, they have an app called No CLC and it's an augmented reality walking tour. So it takes you around the Brooklyn neighborhood and it has images of what different places looked like when Brooklyn was still here. So you can install the app and then take that walk and you can hold up your mobile device and see what it looked like in the past. So definitely okay. download that app and find okay. out and more. About one places. other thing, uh, my son who compiled the pictures for the video is writing something down that you want to hand it to me real quick, almost at the end. Oh, yeah. Please visit Brooklyn Was Here, the video on YouTube, and please like it and share. It's a, it's a, it's a tour through Brooklyn. Any other questions? All right, we actually only have one more minute left in the program. Okay. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank you, AJ, for spending your time with us. Just a reminder for everyone um, that you can visit the library's community read page by going to cmlibrary.org slash community read. And we'd love to have you participate in our community read challenge. And that link is on the page, or you can try and write down this bit.ly link. So thank you once again, AJ, and thank you everyone else for joining us tonight for Community Read Meet the Author with Anna J. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. All right, everyone have a good evening. <laughs>